I was not expecting Ren and Cyborg to be fighting over Nora, but here we are. Ruby has crossed over with DC multiple times now, mostly in the comics, and now they're jumping to making films. Crossovers are usually just for fun. They typically don't do much to progress either property's stories, focusing more on character interactions or action set pieces, and the characters reacting to each other's worlds, which is the case here. I am going to be going into spoilers for this film, so if you want to watch it first and then come back, you should probably do that now. Justice League members wake up suddenly in another world, and they're all teenagers now, and they're struggling to remember what happened and how they got here, only knowing that they fought some kind of mech. They run into the Ruby characters who are also confused, they're all dressed in their original outfits, and they think they still attend Beacon Academy. Also, the Grimm are acting very unusually, they can now absorb dust and use it to power them up, like shooting laser beams or breathing fire. So that's concerning. They all meet up with the exception of Weiss and Batman, who are off in Atlas, and everyone is equally confused and doesn't know what's going on. And this goes on for most of the runtime, so I think the pacing is off. I know they're trying to focus on the mystery, but I think it takes up too much of the runtime. There's also a big cast, like 14 characters. On Ruby's side of things, we of course have Ruby, Blake, Yang, and Weiss, along with Jean, Nora, and Ren. And then from the Justice League, we have Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Vixen, The Flash, Cyborg, and Green Lantern Jessica Cruz. And the film has to juggle them all, so they split them up into groups, which I think was a good call, but it seems like they don't really know what to do with some of these characters. Cyborg mostly complains about not being able to grasp the tech here, and then tries to get Nora's attention, which makes Ren jealous, so the two end up competing for her. It's mostly unspoken, but it's also in your face. They do manage to patch things up in the end, and I'm glad they were able to leave on good terms, but I'm also not sure how appropriate this actually was. The Justice League make it clear that they used to be adults before they woke up here, and they suddenly find themselves de-aged with no explanation, while also pointing out that the Ruby gang are teenagers but then Cyborg still hits on Nora anyway. Same with Batman and Weiss. There's a lot of shipping in this movie, which might be a bit questionable considering the age gap. Just saying. I also feel like a lot of the characters were out of character. Like a scene where Batman expresses that he's thinking about staying on Remnant after all this is over, specifically because he has superpowers on Remnant. Here he becomes a bat faunus, which gives him bat wings and allows him to fly, which I think is a lot cooler than the last time he was a faunus on Remnant, where he just had bad ears instead of wings, but I also feel like they got his character better in that comic. Here he tells Diana that if he can keep these powers and he can do more, and he can be like her, a warrior, which ties into a conversation that Diana was having with Blake and Yang, that she grew up as a warrior while her teammates didn't, but this way he can be like Diana, even if it's not on Earth. I just think this scene really misses the point of who Bruce Wayne is as a character. He's not the kind of person that thinks he needs to rely on superpowers, and he wouldn't just abandon Gotham. Basically everything he does is for Gotham. He's proven over and over again that he's just as capable as the rest of the Justice League, regardless of the fact that he doesn't have powers. He even has a contingency plan in case any of them go rogue, and even one for himself. I realize that this is non-canon, but when you have a crossover like this, it can kind of take the fun out of it when they're acting so out of character. Another scene I took issue with was when they figured out that Ospin is supposed to be dead. They go to Beacon to try to figure out what's going on and find that Ospin is somehow alive, and when they remember that that's not right, he transforms into Oscar. Wonder Woman starts threatening him, picking him up and pinning him against the wall. First of all, she would ask questions, but she wouldn't physically threaten him. It feels like this scene was more for shipping purposes, because Yang comments on how she's strong, which elicits a reaction from Blake. But the whole thing there is pretty silly, considering the fact that Oscar isn't even 100 pounds soaking wet. He is a small child. This is not an impressive feat of strength. They couldn't have shown off her strength during a fight scene or something? Instead, they have her bully Oscar. I realize this isn't actually Oscar, but despite the fact that he's not technically in this movie, they still find a way to bully him. This basically happens every volume. What did Oscar ever do to deserve this? I did like the side plot with Jean and Jessica. They end up going off alone together to find Jessica's ring, since both her ring and Mari's necklace were missing when they woke up in Remnant. Mari's been able to begrudgingly adapt to not using it, but Jessica's having trouble tapping into her semblance, and not having it is exasperating her anxiety. She doesn't want to go alone, and Jean is the only one who offers to go with her. I think it would have made sense if Ruby offered too, considering the fact that she is the one who saw it. She didn't know what it was though, so she just left without taking it, but she could have showed them exactly where she saw it. Instead, she offers to be part of the group that goes into the woods to take on Grimm. She has somewhat of a rivalry with Superman, because both are kind of vying for leadership. The Ruby gang don't want to take orders from the Justice League. It's mostly petty, but they're able to work past those, and Clark compliments Ruby on being a leader. But Jean and Jessica definitely had the most emotional storyline, 
line, where Jean is able to help Jess work through her anxiety and is also confronted with his own past, but he's able to lean on Jess as a friend, even though they only just met. They're confronted with a fake Pyrrha, similar to how Otspin was fake, and she's able to manipulate them into walking into a trap, so they have to work through their trauma to escape before it's too late. They're able to discover that they're not actually on Remnant and are stuck in a simulation, so they go to inform the others and also discover that Flash is possessed by the bad guy. It turns out they were kidnapped by Kilgore, a Flash villain. Admittedly, I was hoping for Brainiac, but I guess this works too. Which means the entire time Flash has been Kilgore. So when they were making fun of Superman's name, Kilgore agreed with them. Sorry, I can't believe you have a teammate named Bat. Man. Now is that better or worse than a teammate named Superman? Right? That's kind of funny actually. Although he's not one to talk considering the fact that he spells his name with a percentage sign instead of an O. What even is that? Apparently he was working with an unnamed Ruby villain to trap them all here, although they don't really go into their motivation, and the Ruby villain goes unnamed. That's probably going to be explored in part two. Right now all we get is the reason why they de-aged them was so that the Justice League could be susceptible to hormones, so they could be distracted through teenage angst and shipping. It's pretty silly, honestly. Kilgore's weird, Ruby has a point about him. Anyway, they have their big final confrontation and they win. I assumed there would be a stinger to close out the film and set us up for part two. Like maybe Kilgore goes, this isn't even my final form, and then the whole world changes to the DC universe. And then the Ruby villain makes his dramatic entrance and they spend part two dealing with all of that or something. But instead everyone goes their separate ways and it pretty much wraps up from there. It ends with the Ruby characters waking up from what was supposed to be a training exercise, only for them to realize it was messed with. It was kind of abrupt, and I think they could have left off with something a little more exciting. I do think what we got was fun, but it was also an hour and a half, and I think this could have been fine as a standalone movie, instead of splitting it into parts. I did like seeing the original designs, in my opinion those were the best Ruby had, and it admittedly made me nostalgic for the first three volumes, but it does feel like something is missing, and I think actually getting to see a team up between the DC villain and a Ruby villain could have really helped make it stand out. I think the Ruby villain is probably someone like Arthur Watts. I'm assuming this takes place before he died. But it would have been fun to see the villains working together, plotting their evil schemes. But instead the characters largely wandered around and were confused, and it just felt like the pacing dragged on a bit. But I still think these crossovers are fun. But that's my opinion. What do you guys think? Have you seen this movie? Did you enjoy it? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching everyone, I really appreciate it. Before I go I want to give a shout out to our members, Stu Tania, Tyrant Carnivore, Adam K, Shiny Orc Boy, The Rabbit Mancer, General Bolivar, Depth Charge Media, Samru163, Gabby Hime, Verdant Range, JVR, Hussyman42, Nixel, Phil C, Taylor Ramirez, Caleb Nelson, Bandito Bane, Dakari the Professor, Equestron, Norman Sweet Cream, Way Beyond Coincidence, Garcia XV Legend, Hunter Rose, Dash Hound, 80s Nostalgia Guy, Miranda Sinistra, Butcher7 Action, Felix Bam, Soundboy00, Owen Wildish, Player0, Kitsune Fiora, Lucas Geist, Lil, Data Dine Executive, and Jay Draws. Thank you all so much for your support. If you want to become a member, you can hit the join button next to the subscribe button. You can also support the channel by leaving a like on this video and subscribing. It helps us out a lot and it's free. We also have Buy Me Coffee if you want to support us that way, and a link to that will be in the description. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye everyone.